is my honour and privilege today to introduce our guest speaker. He is a man that I personally look up to both on and off the rugby field. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome David Boker. I recently attended an interfaith leadership course in Melbourne. It was, um, I've been out injured for a while and one of the upsides of that was I got to take a week off and head down and it was a fantastic experience. And on the first day sitting in the room I realised that it was far and away the most diverse group of people I've ever seen in the same room. So it was, it was challenging at the end of the week. It was, it was, it was one of the best uh, weeks I've experienced in, in those sorts of settings. On, on the first day, one of the exercises we did as a bit of a get to know you, break down the barriers kind of thing, uh, which I'm sure they thought would be pretty simple, was to look at our personal histories, uh, where each of us was from, who were our ancestors, how did we get to live where we live, and become who we are. Where was home for me? And it, it seemed a fairly simple exercise, and many, you know, possibly many in the room thought it, thought it was, and as one person said, I'm Australian, but I will always be Somalian. It has shaped who I am. But the question really troubled me. I've always been really proud to be Zimbabwean, uh, having grown up there. I love the land and, and, and love the people dearly, but I'm also keenly aware of, of my whiteness and the privilege and entitlement that brings, given the colonial history of Zimbabwe. And the same is true here in Australia. I'm an Australian, but I'm also very embarrassed about many things that are tied up in the notion of being an Aussie. An aversion to facing up to our brutal past of murder and dispossession of land. We're the only Commonwealth nation to not have a treaty with its first peoples, let alone recognition in our constitution. A current aversion to looking after our neighbour, the refugee, and a rather patriarchal and racist culture that can be burdensome if you happen to be born something other than a white, heterosexual, middle-class man. The suicide rates amongst the LGBTI community and incarceration rates for Aboriginal people are two glaring examples of our failures as a society. For these reasons and others, I feel really uncomfortable defining myself by this narrow definition of I'm Australian. So where is home for me? I was still thinking about it uh, until during the course of the week I was given a card by a friend from Perth who I very much admired and was actually one of the, the speakers at the conference. On the front of the card was, was a picture of the earth from space and inside he'd written, Home of the Human Family. It, it really got me thinking. And, and that was it. That, that is home. It's home for me, and it's home for you. And it may be simple, but I think it can be very profound if we stop to think about it. We each have our own family histories, our personal histories, experiences. We're all unique. We're one-offs. We have different amounts of pigment in our skin, different coloured hair, eyes, different upbringings, educations, different worldviews, different religious beliefs, political affiliations, but despite all these differences, we are still cut from the same genetic cloth and we inhabit the same earth. The same blue dot orbiting a star in the far-flung reaches of the Milky Way galaxy. In thinking about that, I was reminded of the, the late Carl Sagan, the American astronomer, astrophysicist and cosmologist. And I'd just like to read something that he mentioned in one of his lectures where he had a, an image of the earth from a very long way away, and it was literally this tiny dot. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. Honoured everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, 
every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceit, human conceits, than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. If we take a step back, it becomes evident that we have so much in common. Uh, we have more in common than we have differences. And I guess unfortunately our ways of thinking, our upbringings, often teach us to see and fear the differences before we can actually see them and embrace the things that bring us together. In, in the words of one of my heroes, the American farmer, Joel Salatin, he says, we live in a culture dominated by Western reductionist, linear, fragmented, compartmentalized, segmented, and systemized thought. And while this may be good for some things, uh, I believe it is largely to blame for much of the ideology that's constructed this systems, the system where we have record levels of depression, social fragmentation, all, all the other issues we're seeing here in Australia and abroad. It was Mother Teresa who said, if we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And a concept that cuts straight across this kind of thinking and one that I'd like to share tonight is the very Southern African notion of Ubuntu. Or where I grew up in Zimbabwe, it was called Unu. Ubuntu invites us to look beyond ourselves and in doing so to become more fully human. I am because you are, says Archbishop Desmond Tutu. How I behave impacts not only on me but also the others around me because we all belong together. Ubuntu is the essence of being a person. It means that we are people through other people. We cannot be fully human alone. We are made for interdependence. We are made for family. We need other human beings in order to be human. I am because other people are. We are, we are diminished when others are humiliated or diminished, when others are tortured or oppressed. Zimbabwean author Stan Lake Sankange highlights uh, three maxims of Ubuntuism that shape this philosophy. The, f the first maxim asserts that to be human is to affirm one's humanity by recognizing the humanity of others and, on that basis, establishing respectful human relations with them. And the second maxim means that if and when one is faced with the decisive choice between wealth and the preservation of life, of another human being, then one should opt for the preservation of life. The third maxim says that the elders, rulers, government or decision makers owe their status, including all the powers associated with it, to the will of the people under them. This concept of Ubuntu is incompatible with our fantasies of the, the self-made man or the self-made woman, the self-made millionaire who's toiled so hard to build a fortune. Ubuntu asks at what cost this fortune was made. How many people worked for poor pay in possibly terrible conditions to produce the products that then sold at inflated prices to make a few people very, very rich? For example, we have to look no further than the clothes, the, most of the clothes that are sold in Australia, or the chocolate, um, or the coffee. Um, things that are produced at a, a great cost physically, economically, and socially by people in, in the, developing, the developing world. Ubuntu asks how we can continue to mine and sell our collectively owned natural resources, our land base, and then call it profit. 
put not even profit for all, profit for, for a very small privileged minority. Ubuntu asks why we often fail to take into account the environmental costs. Ubuntu asks how we can put profits from coal mining ahead of potentially catastrophic climate change that it will affect our brothers and sisters the world over far more than it will affect us. Ubuntu is countercultural and can be very uncomfortable for a mostly white middle class crowd like we have here tonight. And it's certainly uncomfortable for me. It could be said that in the lottery of life, the people in this room are, in a very Western idea of the world, winners. We won in the lottery of life. While many of us would put it down to our intelligence or hard work, or perhaps even charisma, the majority of us were born into families that allowed us the opportunities we have had. Studies abound about just how hard it is to get from the bottom to the top in this current economic setup which is based on competition, particularly because we don't all start out with the same options and opportunities. You may be wondering where I'm going with this. I believe that we as, hum as members of the human family, we lose part of our humanity. We lose out on meaningful connectedness and community. We lose a part of ourselves the further we move away from this notion of Ubuntu. I believe that the current system, which privileges a few and condemns the many, is a broken system and really reflects a deep injustice in our world. But I think we are seeing inklings of resistance right here in Australia. We see it in the growing community garden and farmers market movement, where people are trying to become more connected with their neighbours, with the food they eat, with the earth. We can see it in small groups like Welcome to Australia and the Canberra Refugee Support who are supporting newly arrived refugees. We saw it when a mosque in Monash was vandalised and the local community, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, rallied around to help clean up. These examples point to our intuit intuitive understanding that something is not quite right and that a hopeful future is possible. The book being launched tonight, The Treasury of Sayings, not only points towards and speaks of Ubuntu, its pages literally scream Ubuntu. The pages are filled with the sayings of people, people who lived a life of love for others, people like Mother Teresa who I quoted, Martin Luther King, to young people who feel the same Ubuntu, young people like Charlie Boston after returning from a trip to Timor. You can't be human on your own. I feel most alive in the company of others, including the disabled, the poor. My happiness is connected to theirs. My hope is that as we read this collection of sayings, we're not just comforted by the words of others, but we are challenged to live with compassion and to work for justice. Compassion and justice. May we work to build community and a sense of connection. May we help it thrive wherever we see it. From our interpersonal interactions, the way we tread on this glorious planet. Thank you. Yeah.